Plastics. They are a part of our everyday lives, and almost everything that we use contains at least some in it. It is in our phones, gaming consoles, computers, toys, house objects, vehicles, spaceships. I mean, the list is so vast that if I were to name everything, this video would take days, not minutes. And the problem seems only to be getting worse. During the 1950s, when plastics were introduced, production was about 2 million metric tons per year. Fast forward to 2015 and that number increased 190 times to about 380 million metric tons per year, amassing to a whopping 9 billion metric tons of plastic waste. With that much plastic, you could cover the island of Manhattan with Empire State buildings made out of plastic. Catch this, three times over. And that is not all, by 2050, this number is estimated to further increase 4.7 times, or 1800 million metric tons per year, and most of it will either end up underground or in the oceans. But plastic production is only a part of the problem. Recycling, something that we all think it's taking place with the majority of types of plastic, is far from the truth. Only 19.5% of all plastics produced are recycled. The remaining 25.5 and 55% are either incinerated or simply discarded. This happens mainly because most plastic types reach its peak in recyclable phase or can't be recycled at all since it costs more to recycle them than to make fresh new products. Therefore, the only choice is to discard them. Now, there may be a new recycling approach that could deal with this problem and ignite a new wave of recycling initiatives to produce one of the most exciting materials ever made by men. A material that is on the horizon to revolutionize almost everything, just like plastic did seven decades ago, but with none of the problems. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. Plastics are usually made with organopolymers, such as polyamides, polycarbonate, polyester, polyethylene, and many others. They are derived or synthesized from petrochemicals, with a market size valued at $518 billion in 2019. By 2027, the plastic packaging sector will be responsible for over 35% of the world's revenue and will significantly increase the problem we already have with recycling, since most packaged goods are not recyclable at all, or at least, are difficult to do so. When I say difficult, I don't mean recycling methods. What it really means is that there isn't a lot of financial incentive for companies or governments to explore ways to recycle these items. And as everything else, it all comes down to economics. Since it is cheaper to either dump or incinerate, why would anyone want to recycle? The key to solve this problem would be to make recycling financially profitable with an end product that is economically attractive and it can be used in almost anything with an increasing demand that most likely will drive the economy. This is something that graphene offers. Just to give you an idea, graphene can be used as a concrete strengthener whereby adding just 0.02% by weight into the concrete mix, it can increase its strength by up to 35%. That means way less concrete needed for any structure, which in turn translates into cost savings. But to achieve this, we need a method that can produce large quantities of graphene from any carbon-rich source, and that is exactly what flash graphene is able to provide. Finding cheaper ways to make high-quality graphene in bulk took the scientific world by storm. And so far, there are at least 16 different methods of making it, but few of them are capable of mass production at a low cost and high quality. As of current times, the price of graphene per kilogram stands in between $67 to $200 per kilogram, depending on the overall quality of the end product. It is only a few hundred dollars away from silver at $579 per kilogram. But to bring the price down, one would have to miraculously solve many of the other methods' problems, such as be able to make graphene out of almost anything that is carbon-rich, get rid of solvents or chemical additives, no special environments like vacuum or inert gas atmospheres, 
And lastly, it has to yield large quantities of usable graphene. Usable means it has to have a minimal number of stacked layers in a non-AB stacked arrangement, which is what graphite exfoliation produces. In fact, most methods in the list produce this type of graphene. AB stacked is when graphene layers are stacked with ordered carbon elements. Much like graphite, this makes it harder for graphene flakes to be added to solvents or composite materials. Now, turbostratic is the opposite of that, and the fact that the layers are not ordered makes it easy to separate them and add to almost anything. By far the most promising approach is the flash jewel heating method. Here, they introduce a carbon-rich sample in between two electrodes inside a quartz tube. The sample is then blasted with 200 to 400 volts. This heats the sample up to about 3000 Kelvin, while other experiments the temperature could even reach 5000 Kelvin. All of this happens in a flash, or 100 milliseconds, rendering the name flash graphene. Not only this method can solve all of the problems I mentioned earlier, but the quality of yield is closely related to the carbon source and electrode compression. The process yields turbostratic graphene in bulk, where quantity ranges in between 80 to 99% of the initial sample. But this is only the beginning. Experiments have shown that scaling production would be as simple as just making the quartz tube bigger, and it would look something like this. The quartz tube would have an inlet and outlet. When production begins, the first electrode moves out of the way to let carbon-rich samples be placed inside the tube. The electrode then moves into place to compress the sample. This is based on what is best for the carbon source in question, and the voltage applied will also depend on it, and it varies accordingly. The goal is to reach temperatures above 2000 Kelvin, whereas is the minimal temperature that yielded good results. Like I mentioned before, all of this happens in an instant or around 10 to 150 milliseconds, and once the process is over, the second electrode is retracted to allow graphene to be removed. In theory, this process can be repeated multiple times. But how good is this method? Well, get ready for this. They were able to use coffee grounds to make graphene. Of course, they had to add a bit of carbon to increase its conductivity, but at the end of the day, they got what they wanted, and in this case, they were able to achieve 85% conversion. Take into account that coffee grounds are 40% carbohydrates, and 35% of that became graphene sheets. That is an impressive high yield. And coffee grounds is just a small sample of what can be achieved here. The range of what can be used goes from coal to petroleum coke, mixed plastic waste, many types of rubber, biomass, and even food waste. If we consider that this method can be effectively used with the plastic problem that we have today, then we are talking about not only increasing recycling capabilities, but also boosting the graphene industry. After all, graphene is the wonder material that a lot of companies are looking forward to work with in the near future. It will definitely create the financial incentive that was missing for almost 80% of all plastic waste. What a brilliant idea! And after this video, some of you graphene aficionados are wondering how they were able to achieve this. Well, creating new technologies like this one requires extensive knowledge of physics and chemistry. But you don't have to be a genius. The internet offers to everyone access to knowledge. But few sources are able to provide a good understanding of complex topics, and most people quit when things get really intricate. Brilliant is the opposite, making learning easy and fun. So, if you want to create complex machinery to help solve the plastic problem, for instance, you could start with the course Scientific Thinking. After all, to solve a complex problem, you must first identify its basic, smaller, simpler problems and tackle one by one. For that, knowing scientific principles will help you see the world in a different light. Just as an example, flash jewel heating is nothing new. As a matter of fact, it was invented in 1840. The genius here was to apply scientific thinking to understand the problem, how to somehow make graphene out of waste products and correlate with the method. The scientific thinking here was that you have to break all chemical bonds with a lot of energy and allow carbon to rearrange itself into graphene layers by removing any other elements from the mix. A little bit of research and you will land on flash jewel heating. To get to this level of thinking, 
You need to understand basic scientific principles. And this course has no prerequisites. Literally, anyone can do it. All you need is to pay attention to the rules and be imaginative. You can sign up for free or if you click on the link below, the first 200 subjects will get a 20% discount on a one-year subscription. A good way to support the channel and science. Alright folks, that's it. We're done here.